Good afternoon. My name is Lefteris Karalambos. I'm a partner with McKinsey, and along with Lucas Yomas, junior partner with McKinsey, both of us focusing on energy and heavy industry. Today, we're going to try to introduce a new narrative for climate change. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lefteris. So, what are the six key messages that we need to remember about climate change? First and foremost, climate change is having a substantial impact today at the local level across the world and the affected regions will only grow. So it's something that is happening and will grow. Second, our region, the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean will actually be prone to major changes like heat, drought and water supply issues, putting agriculture, infrastructure and livability, practically the things that we take as a given, at risk. Third, the only way to prevent further damage beyond 2030 is to actually reach net zero emissions by 2050 with a significant 50% reduction in regards to GHG emissions by 2030. That pathway requires a significant massive innovation as well as major investments that will create significant opportunities in regards to GHG emissions. Fourth, all stakeholders, industries, capital providers, regulators will be needed in the journey in order to achieve that pathway. Capital allocation will be the primary driver of action across industries as well as geographies, and we'll look at this in more detail going forward. Finally, a paradigm shift is going to be needed in order to embed climate change into risk and into broader decision making in order to adapt to the changes and decarbonize, decarbonize at scale in order to mitigate physical risk. Finally, we bring this to the current situation, right? How does this get affected by Corona? We want to consider Corona as a major opportunity for an acceleration in regard to climate change. How can this act as a significant catalyst in order not just for us to turn climate change into an opportunity, but also accelerate it significantly? Now, let's take a step back and look at the history of the planet. Human beings have been around for approximately 200,000 years. Out of these 200,000 years, for the vast majority of this time, we have been nomads. Nomads focusing primarily on hunting. We have been moving around. We have been looking only until tomorrow. The near term, the very near term. Now, 10,000 years ago, something changed. And we turned from being hunters, from being nomads, into being farmers. This allowed us to build stock, to build resources, and stop looking only until tomorrow, but the day after, to have a leeway for the future. This became the primary base foundation for modern civilizations. So what actually happened 10,000 years ago? What was this primary change that led to the creation of modern civilizations? This primary change was the climate. What we see here is two things. One is the evolution of global temperatures for the last 350,000 years, as well as the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Why CO2 is important? Because it acts as the primary thermostat of the planet. It regulates the temperature. So if we look back during the last 350,000 years, there is a pivotal change 10,000 years ago. CO2 levels start stabilizing. Before that, there is a great significant volatility during the years. So 10,000 years ago, CO2 levels stabilize. And with that, the temperature stabilizes. And this provides certainty. It allows us to actually stabilize our lives as human beings. It allows us to start changing the way that we think about tomorrow and start having predictability. Now, 
in a very short period of time, actually since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which is the last part of this chart, we have actually experienced a massive increase in regards to the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. This has actually increased from 280 ppm to 415 in such a very short period of time for Earth's history and for the history of the human species. Now, what will this mean for the predictability that we discussed before? It may have a significant impact on the way that the climate changes, which we already see, and it will actually significantly influence how we actually work within this climate. Now, this has a direct influence on extreme events. What we see here is practically the statistical evolution of temperature anomalies from 1961 to 1980 to today, to the last few years. It is pretty evident that the distribution of temperatures have changed. What does this mean? One, that the average days that we experience are warmer, and two, that extreme events in regards to temperature are becoming much more likely. These two combined have increased the risk of increased temperatures by 75 times in just a small period of 50 years. And this is pretty evident from what we see all around us. There are phenomena which are unprecedented. First and foremost, we see floodings around the world. A common example, what we saw in China in 2016. Two, extreme hurricanes, typical examples in the United States. Five out of 10 most destructive hurricanes in the US have occurred during the last 10 years. And finally, extreme bushfires. We all remember what happened in Australia about a year ago. The frequency of bushfires has increased by 40% in the last five years. So extreme events. So where is the risk? That is a map of the planet and its temperatures. What are we going to experience around the world? How mortgages and markets will stay afloat in Florida, which is close to the waters? Will the world bread baskets, bread, availability of food grow less reliable? Will infrastructure bend or break in regard to climate stress? Are the global centers of economic activity going to be resilient to climate hazard? Which countries will actually be affected in regards to their richness level, their, their prosperity levels? All of these emerging economies that will drive the future of the planet. And finally, to bring it to us, our beautiful Mediterranean climate. How will the Mediterranean look without this beautiful climate? By 2050, on the back of all of those disruptors, we actually expect to see a significant shift across systems in livability and workability, food systems, physical assets, infrastructure services, and natural capital. Major changes that will need to be managed. And going back to our climate, right? Uh, we know our lives in the Mediterranean, which is based on practically what? Warm but dry summers, as well as very mild winters, which contribute to pretty much everything that we experience in our everyday lives and everything that everyone loves when they come to the Mediterranean. How this is going to change from now to 2030 to 2050. First and foremost, the number of days above 37 degrees in southern Spain, Turkey and Egypt, as well as Greece, are expected to double from 30 to 60. Second, drought is expected to become prevalent in the Mediterranean region by 2030 and also further increase by 2050. And finally, most parts of the Mediterranean will experience shifts, significant shifts in water supply, as well as increasing water stress. So what is the solution, right? What will take us to a completely new normal which will allow us to deal with this risk? First and foremost, on the left side, we see the annual CO2 emissions up until now. We see that we have built a significant stock. What will happen if we take no further action? They will continue to increase and increase significantly. 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. How will we get to a new normal? We need to stabilize and very, very quickly go through a massive decline. Now, out of the different pathways there, a paced pathway seems to be the best and most orderly, and it needs to happen fast. Uh, what are the ways to actually achieve this? this massive decrease in such a short time. One, 
reduce demand, change how we power and fuel our lives, scale up a carbon management industry, and tackle other GHG emissions beyond the normal ones. This will take significant leadership from different stakeholders everywhere in every part of value generation. And at the same time, it will actually require a coordination between capital that is allocated into new investments, industries, and the way that we actually generate value today, energy intensive industries that are consumer facing and not, so oil and gas, power, chemicals, the usual suspects that actually contribute to the phenomenon, but also have the levers to do change it. And finally, regulation, government and industry. So to, to wrap up what happened up until today, up until COVID, right? What is the narrative that we know about climate change? One is we need to make a paradigm shift in order to manage it. And the three ways to do it are, first and foremost, we need to properly embed climate risk into all decision making. Two, we need to adapt to existing climate risk. So what do we do to adapt? And finally, we need to actually mitigate the risk. So we need to decarbonize at scale in order to reduce the impact of the phenomenon in the future. And with that, I will pass on to Lefteris. Thanks. So Lucas took us all the way to 200,000 years back. I'm going to take us only a few months back, right? The climate change discussion has been going on for decades. And it has actually peaked over the last few years with all the scientific uh, evidence, but also the debate on policy. Over the last few months, we have actually experienced the unique circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the common debates that we're actually experiencing with our clients is what would be the impact of this experience to the whole debate on climate change. And there is a lot to consider to come up with you know, a conclusion on that, because we can draw a lot of similarities in the two events. So on the one hand, the climate change, on the other, the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are some similarities that have to do with the event itself. Systemic events so affecting our interconnected world as a whole, non-stationary, so it's a completely new situation, no experience to draw from the past, nothing to extrapolate from, no learnings to draw from. Non-linear effects, very complicated uh, underlying drivers resulting into exponential effects and actually accelerating effects at the peak of the event. Regressive events with not, this, with not an, uh, an evenly spread out impact in different populations or geographies. And there are also some similarities that have to do with the actions taken. Completely unprepared we were for this. And that goes for the government, it goes for the companies, it goes for the society itself. However, it was an event that was known, very broadly covered in literature, both climate change but also the uh, probability of a pandemic. And both of them are actually tail events, resilience events. So events where an upfront cost, like an insurance, is much lower to the impact of a tail event. And finally, an event where individual actions can actually have a huge impact to the common. At the same time, it's not exactly the same, right? Um, and we're noting here some fundamental differences, starting from you know, the uh, accelerations of the time period that this has occurred, all the way to how discrete it was compared to a cumulative effect that the climate risk is, to having a very clear um, uh, track back of the root cause compared to a very complicated system, and all the way to the type of the risk, but also the effect it has on humans. So the pandemic had a very direct survival challenge to people, as opposed to a longer term effect that the climate change has. How does the COVID-19 situation seems to affect the climate change debate? There are elements that draw the conclusion that it will accelerate the implementation of actions to mitigate climate risk. For example, some of the behavioral change we've seen with digitization and remote work and the reduction in emissions, especially in transportation, is definitely a lever that could stay. On top of that, the broader uh, address of emissions from regulators going beyond the direct emissions all the way to what we call scope three emissions, so the induced emissions, and also the, uh, more, the higher scrutiny from capital markets and investors pricing in risk are definitely things that could actually accelerate addressing climate risk. And all of this, putting the awareness in, uh, into account, can actually also drive increased scientific expertise and better understanding of phenomena. 
At the same time, also, if we combine COVID-19 with the upcoming economic recession, there are elements that will slow down the climate risk address. Starting all the way from uh, the reduction in fossil fuels, right, the prices, that reduces the business case for green investments, but also the focus of governments in economic recovery could also, could also slow down. Then everything that has to do with how companies allocate their capital would also be affected by the COVID situation. And then also having a very national focused uh, agenda could also reduce the uh, consensus needed to address a global problem like climate risk. But at that point, I think we are, we are pretty lucky because I think the COVID-19 situation gave us a unique opportunity. It gave us a unique opportunity to experience in a very accelerated and a condensed way a tail event. It showed us how the effect of something that has very low probability and maybe potentially a long, uh, longer term uh, effect could actually hit us. And that happened in real life. And that's why we see a lot of consensus in executives, at least for companies, on how this could accelerate addressing climate risk. We actually ran a, a, a survey in our CEO group in heavy industry, and there was actually a consensus of 95% of CEOs that were saying that climate risk would actually be at least the same priority as it is right now. But what could governments, companies, and the society broadly do to actually take advantage of the COVID-19 shakeout. The governments could actually build on capabilities to better understand situations through actually understanding the complicated uh, dynamics of tail events like pandemic. The companies, they will have to factor in these tail events in the way they run their business. And that would include changing everything from governance to their strategy, but also making sustainability a core pillar of their business. And finally, societies, through this increased awareness that came with COVID, could actually change the mindset of people broadly that will also drive bottom-up awareness, but also actions to address climate risk. Thank you.